Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. Oh, my goodness. So, hi. Um, I just gave, I, this is my first time using IG Live. Hello, welcome. Hello. Um, I thought I just gave a whole introduction, but I wasn't live yet, so <laughs> let me start again. Um, thank you for joining me today. Thank you to the Emily Taylor Center, to Megan Williams, and all the staff that have been so helpful in working with me as we came to uh, this day. Um, I've decided to do my reading outside in my backyard. You can hear the cicadas, they can get kind of loud, there might be some birds flitting by, but they are here to accompany us as, as, as well. Um, my name is Imani Wadud. I am a sixth year PhD candidate in the Department of American Studies at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. And um, I came to Yoke by Jessamine Stanley, my yoga of self-acceptance through wanting to find a book that would accompany me through the difficulties of writing around um, the politics of working together and um, the necessary things that might need to be done internally and externally in order to lean into desired difference and to think about um, black liberation um, and expressive and creative practices um, in a more holistic manner while tackling white supremacy and uh, global empire making structures, right? Yoke. My Yoga of Self-Acceptance has been a book that has really helped me this past week, especially to lean into practices of adaptation. So in that vein, I have a couple of points. Hi, I have a couple of points in the book that I, I want to share, but um, because I write and theorize on adaptation as like a way to do magical things in your ordinary life to like lean into the unexpected as your standard maybe um i've also decided to randomly choose points in the book to share as well so i have a point in the beginning and a point in the end that i'd like to you know select but we'll see what else comes so i guess i can go ahead and um start reading, but um, Jessamine um, Stanley is the uh, founder of the Underbelly, an inclusive wellness community and streaming app, and um, is co-host of the podcast Dear Jessamine and co-founder of We Go High, a North Carolina-based cannabis justice initiative. Yes, North Carolina, my place of birth, Durham, let's go. Um, so Jessamine's definitely making ways, uh, queer yogini extraordinaire for sure, you know, and I, I really appreciate, appreciate the honesty, the radical honesty that she also brings in the writing. So, um, on that note, let's, let's get started. Okay. Yoke. So if you see the contents, right, these are all really short chapters. Um, so I'm going to start at the very beginning and we'll work our way from there. Okay. And yes, I'm gonna start with the forward. I wrote most of the essays in this book before 2020, before COVID-19, when Breonna Taylor and George Floyd were still with us. Every day, more of what we know falls apart. The dream of America is burning. Everyone is scared of what will happen next. No one is immune to the fear, and everyone's fear is valid. Pull up a chair. Your fear is welcomed here. You are welcome here exactly as you are. 
You don't need to change anything or do anything differently. You don't need to hide anything differently or pretend that something's not there. All your sadness, all your anger, all your doubt, all your frustration, all your confusion, it's all welcome here. All of you is welcome here. The part where it's uncomfortable, the part where you're ashamed of yourself, the part where you say the wrong thing and piss someone off, the part where you're stuck in the same place and don't know what to do next. The universe is forcing us to quit with the bullshit and to show up, to show each other how we really feel. But when you forgive the smelliness and accept the ugliness of it all, what lies beneath is just as beautiful as anything else, just as beautiful as a decaying flower, a rose on the last day of its life. Have hope in yourself, in your family, and in your children. We have seen worse than this. We will see worse than this. There is always hope, even when there may be worse to come. So the first um, chapter, I think that's just a, a beautiful invocation. You know, an invitation to join in on the journey that is yoke. So, chapter one, yoke. In between, and I just want a, a short caveat, in between each of these chapters are um, sutra excerpt, excerpted from Sri Shrami Satchi uh, and translated with commentary. And so, um, at the beginning here, one of them says 1.2, the restraint of the modifications of the mind stuff is yoga. Practice becomes firmly grounded when well intend, attended to for a long time, without break and in all earnestness. And then 1.13. It means you become eternally watchful, scrutinizing every thought, every word, and every action. So, Jessamine starts. Okay. So, it's after midnight, a few months after the release of Everybody Yoga, my first book. I'm wide awake in my office and knee deep in the Wikipedia wormhole that a Gmail notification bloops into view. For the record, I hate push notifications. They're such a buzzkill. Sometimes they're helpful, but then again, so are <laughs> mansplainers. And just like a mansplainer, a push notification is more likely to irreparably fuck with your day. <laughs> anyway, this particular notification was from someone who'd read Everybody Yoga and was so deeply affected by it that she felt compelled to send me an email in the middle of the night. A complete stranger sent me an email in the middle of the night. <sighs> Sigh. In my experience, unsolicited late night correspondence from a complete stranger is rarely a good thing. I found that the fine print on being a fat black queer yoga teacher in a predominantly thin white and very straight yoga industry is that there are just as many people who are inspired by you as there are with a strong desire for you to shut the fuck up. I pressed my palms together and prayed for the best. Apparently, the messenger was a freelance copy editor soliciting her services on my next literary project because, as a yoga practitioner herself, she was appalled by a very specific type, uh, typo in everybody yoga. Uh-oh. <laughs> I snatched up my nearest copy of everybody yoga and about got a, p a paper <laughs> cut in pursuit of the page she'd referenced. My heart stopped. Right there on page Twenty fucking nine. I'd accidentally defined the Sanskrit word yoga as meaning to yoke. Girl, I about fell out. I'd meant to use the word yoke, meaning to join together. Yoga means to yoke, as in to join together the light and dark of life, the good and the bad. Yoke, as in let's yoke these cattle together. To yoke is to marry breath thought and movement to connect the body mind and spirit to yoke is to explore the meaning of balance this definition stands in stark contrast to the definition of yoke in stark contrast to the definition of yoke which means the yellow food storage sphere composing a substantial percentage of an egg's interior this was a glaring typo certainly worth criticism i couldn't believe that after Dozens of drafts and round after round of edits, I failed to notice such an obvious mistake. Now I've got to get be honest with you, especially if you and I are going to have a real relationship and not just <laughs> be on some bullshit. Straight up, my knee-jerk reaction to this email was to pop shots. How dare this bitch try to call me out? And in a passive-aggressive, after-midnight, stranger-danger-ass email, no less. 
if she was in fact a copy editor and not merely a bored lonely internet troll nursing a vendetta as i secretly suspected then she must understand that typos are to be expected in a work of any substantial size before long i was shit talking and verbally drop (laughs) kicking this bitch all the way into next week But once my Mars and Cancer cleared the scene, my anger uh, flashed to red hot embarrassment. I was seized by the need to wake up my editor so we could risk to run risk assessment options as possibly reprinting everybody's yoga. Let's see. So we could run the risk assessment options on possibly reprinting every everybody's yoga entire run. Instead, I did something that's gradually become my uh, Pavlovian response to stress and anxiety. I sighed, closed my eyes, walked over to my yoga mat, and unrolled it right in the middle of my office. I didn't start practicing headstands or any acrobatic shit like that. I just sat down and closed my eyes. I didn't tell myself, time to meditate. I didn't start a timer or practice a specific breathing technique. I just sat down and focused my attention on trying to breathe, steady in and out and through the nose. I didn't try to stop thinking about what was stressing me out. I actually did the exact opposite. I let my Virgo rising sun wild and allowed myself to consider every nook and cranny of my anxiety. Instead of trying to kick out my inner critic, I made space at the table. And the whole time as my mind raked my angst over the coals, I just tried to breathe. At first my breath came shallow and timid, tinted with uncertainty. But as my body submitted to its whim, my breath stood up straighter and rolled back its shoulders. I started to take its, it started to take itself seriously and believe in itself. My breath whistled around the branches of my anxiety and I found myself softening like forgotten butter. And gradually I began to see the surface of what had actually pissed me off. It wasn't the typo. It wasn't the email or a sender. It was my imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome I felt since I've posted my first yoga picture on Instagram. The feeling that I didn't know enough about yoga to participate in a mainstream conversation about it. The feeling that I could never read enough books, that I could never take enough classes, that I could never work on postures hard enough. I'd managed to publish a whole ass book about yoga before my 30th birthday. And I subconsciously believed that every yoga practitioner and teacher knew how unqualified I was for the task. I doubted my abilities, assumed that everyone else did as well. As a social media influencer yoga teacher, I regularly feign confidence. Much as I try to fight it, projecting confidence is part of the influencer job description. Yet all it took was one loose-lipped email from a complete stranger about a singular typo to crush my projection of of confidence. Cornered by shame and inadequacy, I saw how I spent most of my days and much of my energy desperately trying to outrun the truth. On my yoga mat, forlorn in my crab shell and weary of the chase, I stopped running. Instead of continuing to run, I embraced my fear of myself, and I began unbandaging wounds that I've carried as long as I can remember. All wounds need to breathe, no matter how painful or smelly, even the wounds you'd rather keep hidden. Yoga links the deepest and most conflicted aspects of myself, the light and the dark, the bad and the good, the ups and the downs. It's both a process and a destination, both a question and an answer. I turned 25 in the summer of 2012 and dropped out of my arts management MFA program a month before my birthday, a decision that mostly scared the shit out of me. I needed a change and a new town seemed like a good, a place, as good a place as any to find one. So I loaded up my car and moved from Winston-Salem to Durham, North Carolina. My new girlfriend, S, had just moved to Durham and even though we both felt it was too early in our relationship for cohabitation, neither of us could afford to live on our own. Plus, we were each other's only friend in Durham, so we agreed it'd be better to stick with the devil, you know. Mm, Son. For the first bit, S and I shared a tiny twin bed and an even tinier apartment owned by two middle-aged co-dependent black dykes that we co-named Big Bear and Little Bear. While Big B and Little B spoon. Uh, spooned on the queen next door, S and I slept like a seal pod on the bed built for a teenager. 
two adult fatties in a twin bed, even a twin XL ain't nobody's idea of a long-term solution. And certainly not a poorly air, air conditioned prefab apartment in North Carolina's armpit at the heat, at the height of summer. S and I brought, brought to our relationship nearly 20 combined years of le lesbian codependency. None of it, not one stinking year had adequately prepped us for the ugly reality of sharing that teeny weeny bed. Not even the most <laughs> lesbianist boarding school memories were proper training. After a while, we'd just alternate between one of us sleeping on the floor while the other one spread out like a starfish on the bed. As for storage space, my car was the closet, leaving me one car jacking away from the uh, the loss of all my worldly possessions. So by the time S and I got settled in an apartment that fit both our bodies and our wallets, we had bigger shit on our mind than limited closet space. Within the first year or so of living together as his brother, Richard, my aunt, uh, Tiraya, and my grandmother, Marvella, all died. First uh, was my aunt, Tiraya. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The aunt who taught me how to bathe myself and who caught me getting fresh with the boy next door. Aunt Tariah always understood me, especially when my mom didn't. Maybe you don't believe in dying of a broken heart, but I think my grandma's grief over my aunt's sudden passing brought on her own. The diabetes she successfully managed for at least a decade somehow became unmanageable after Aunt Tariah died. And just a few months after his 25th birthday, Richard was murdered in a hit and run car accident. S and I literally had just seen him. I swear he'd been by the house not even a few weeks before we got the call. His was the kind of death that makes people uh, tut tut because what else is there to say when an intelligent, beautiful, witty, creative, and incredibly kind person who just turned 21 dies senselessly and far too soon? Their death left a void that S and I were unsure how to fill. I thought God might be the answer, but I had my doubts. I was raised a devout uh, Baha'i household but I'd drifted from the religiosity of my childhood. Retreating to its complicated embrace in the wake of death felt disingenuous to me. I was drifting and felt unsure of where, to, of where or even how to pivot. I maintained a regular Berkham yoga practice for a year before moving, moving to Durham and it had drastically helped my mental health as things fell apart in my grad program. My budget had been way too tight for the drop-in rates at my local studio, but I was able to participate in a work-study program that allowed me to help out with studio housekeeping in exchange for free yoga classes. That's dope. As soon as I got settled in Durham, I sought out similar work opportunities at every yoga studio I could find. I was disappointed to find that Durham's yoga scene was much more crowded and competitive than Winston-Salem's. Most of the studios I solicited didn't have work-study programs at all. Those that did had overflowing wait lists. I added my name but held little hope. For several weeks, I didn't practice yoga at all, and I didn't miss it one bit. I figured it was just another hobby I could let fall to the wayside, like the summer I dabbled in oil painting or the years I spent collecting vintage fondue pots and early editions of The Joy of Cooking. I didn't, re I didn't give a fuck about the mind-body-spirit connection. I'd yet to make the connection between yoga and my improved mental health, so I didn't really value its presence in my life. I thought dissatisfaction was a hallmark of life, and if anything, yoga had been a distraction from reality. Then one day, out of the blue, I enrolled my yoga mat on the singular strip of empty hardwood floor in our cramped living room. The mat was handed down to me by my daddy, a longtime Pilates nut. He gave me his old mat when I started going to yoga classes. His muscles were molded into the PVC, which stunk of both our sweat. It may not have been more than a dust ru uh, ruffle between me and the floorboards, but at least it was a little cushion for the pushing. At first, I just sat there on the mat, unsure of how to go forward without a teacher. I was accustomed to following the guidance of yoga generalisms. Without a teacher to follow, I was paralyzed by performance anxiety. I wondered, am I even allowed to practice yoga without supervision? Of course, said the voice. The voice with the capital V. I didn't know where the voice was coming from, but it sounded very steady and solid, like a deeply assured version of myself, and it sounded way too confident to contradict. I stood up and walked to the top of my mat. I rolled back my shoulders, laced my fingers beneath my chin, and started practicing Berkram's yoga I iconic breathwork invocation. It felt a little weird to practice without any supervision, a bit freeing, a bit scary, like crossing the street without holding my mom's hand or riding a bike without training wheels. But once I got going, I still found myself awaiting further instructions. 
As if on cue, the voice began reciting every posture I'd mentally stored from the Berkram sequence. The voice couldn't remember every single alignment cue that my Berkram teachers had ever uttered, but it remembered enough. With gentle but firm benevolence, the voice reminded me to keep my fingers interwoven with my thumbs, rested against the thin skin that protects my th throat. It reminded me to soften the very back of my gullet, inhaling it and exhaling deeper with each successive breath. The voice reminded me to treat each breath like my last. I was so relieved to hear the voice. I held hands with the voice and allowed the voice to guide my body into action. The voice reminded me of every yoga pose I enjoyed in the Berkman sequence, even the ones I hated. In the privacy of our tiny apartment, furnished with our cat's hair and our complications, I rolled and curled and bent myself into shapes I've been too timid to attempt when surrounded by other practitioners. And in those postures, I found myself trying harder and going further than I had ever before. I began to notice the difference between who I am in the privacy of my own identity and who I choose to be in front of other people. I'm always afraid of offending other people or being too much, too big, talking up to, taking up too much space, making too many sounds, being too hard to handle or too much to control. I began to see how much I restrained myself in public, making myself small and trying not to be noticed. But at home, I found myself con um, contorting and emitting sounds I'd never had the confidence to express in public. I stopped apologizing for being loud and granting myself permission to take up space. At home, everything was on the table. I could wear my underwear, smoke weed, and share meditative breaths with my cat. It didn't matter that I only knew a few postures. Instead of getting my usual uh, route of obsessing over everything I didn't know, I focused all my energy on the eight to 10 poses that I did know. Instead of trying to know it all, I just let myself know what I know. So I'm going to skip a little bit ahead, I think. for time's sake because it is all so rich. But just at the last part, she says, the yoga of everyday life is the same thing. It's finding within life's shittiest moments the same flexibility, strength, grounding, energy, and core awareness that you find in extending hand to big toe pose or headstand. This is yoga without accessories, a yoga you can practice without ever stepping on a mat. When someone cuts you off in traffic and you resist the urge to road rage on them, that's yoga. Even if you do road rage on them, that's still yoga. When, you, when your estranged parent rolls back into your life out of the blue after being gone for years and you're forced to deal with decades of trauma, that's yoga. When someone you love dies and you find a way to somehow keep your head above water, that's yoga. When you give birth to a whole ass human being and then parent them for the rest of their life, that's yoga. When you, that time your kid called you a bitch in the middle of a crowded shopping center and you resisted the urge to abandon them on the spot, that was yoga. When you accept your faults and the faults of others, that's yoga. Yoga is to yoke. You yoke when you find a reason to get out of bed in the morning. You yoke when you peel yourself off the pavement after your heart's been broken again. You yoke when you manage to keep moving in spite of being completely overwhelmed. You're always yoking, all the time. My yoking... My, my yoking in about anybody but me. And I can't continue to wither under imposter syndrome until other people co-sign my self-worth. I can only ever allow to know myself and be present to my own divinity. I'm the only one who will ever know me and I'm enough. Imposter syndrome is a distraction from the work at hand. My yoga has many intersections and edges because like the universe, I'm always unfolding. My yoga is finding out what it means to be a black queer woman in a world that doesn't want me to be. I'm holding space for when I've been assaulted, even when I'd rather hide my pain at the bottom of a bottle or a box. It's questioning my pursuit of power. It's coming to terms with a God of my own understanding, not a God that's been chosen for me. My yoga will probably eventually offend you. I mean, it offends me. But yoga isn't about feeling only the happy emotions. It's about feeling all the emotions, even when the emotion du jour is anger. One of the hardest things for me to accept is that not everyone will agree with or like how I've chosen to accept myself. I'm still that girl who wants the, wants the popular kids to like her. And when the popular kids don't understand where I'm coming from or they get angry at me for refusing to swim in the mainstream, I have to accept that too. 
I have to accept being disliked and misunderstood because being disliked and misunderstood has more to do with how the popular kids feel about themselves than how I feel about me. I can be disliked and be myself at the same time. That was the first chapter called Yoke. And so now I am going to skip a little bit for time's sake because each and every part of this book has, 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 has given me um, something. And I've read it this past week. So how about hmm, the section? Poses. Poses. Let's see what Poses has in store. When I, when I started practicing yoga, I really didn't give a fuck about anything but the poses. All this yogic philosophy I've been jabbering about, man, that shit didn't make any sense to me. Honestly, I wasn't even sure if I was allowed to care because back then, I really wasn't sure whether people who aren't Indian should be even practicing yoga at all. When you hear the word yoga, it's almost always defined as a physical exercise. Classical yoga teachers have always been told the virtues of yogic spirituality, but postures are still the primary language of American yoga. Postures are a great introduction to the basics of yoga practice, but they're not meant to serve as your soul path to inner knowledge. They're just a great way to get children prepped for meditation. Vinyasa style yoga classes are actually developed as energy maintenance for children, particularly young boys. You're always a child in the infancy of your yoga journey, no matter how old you are when you first step on the mat. The postures are an introduction to the core elements of a spirituality beyond religiosity. Sometimes simply moving the body and connecting to the breath are all you need to set foot on the path towards transcendence. I think the poses are easy for Americans to understand because they fit into our worldview. Americans value physical beauty over almost anything else, and yet therefore we value dedication to physical refinement. Tap, tap, tap. I still don't regret being outside. I welcome the sweat. So, when I started practicing yoga, I, oh, that's not where I am. Postural work is a familiar recitation of the same narrative we've been fed since birth. A narrative wherein physical health is the ultimate wealth, and the decay of the physical body marks the end of all that matters. But what's the real purpose of keeping your body in perfect condition? To prevent it from aging? To keep it from frozen in time? But the art of aging is the is life's great crescendo. Your aging is your loudest moment, your greatest depth. You exist to age. I think the art of aging is to age with humility and grace, to age and enjoy the process, to welcome age with open arms. Obsessing over the human's body's physical conditions and postures is another way of trying not to age. Poses don't really matter that much, but according to the yoga industrial complex, a strong yoga practice means you have to be able to turn your spine inside out like Linda Blair in the Exodus while holding a handstand on the edge of a mountain. General wisdom says that the more poses you know, the better you are at yoga. And the better you are at yoga, the better you are at being alive. That being able to contort your body means you're a good person, maybe even a better person than somebody else. But is that what yoga is about? Being a better person than somebody else? Not hardly. How can you be a better person than somebody else? That's not a thing. And that's precisely the spot where the yoga industrial complex fucked up the game. Because yoga isn't ever about trying to get onto... Oh, because yoga isn't ever trying to get one up on anybody. That's supremacy you're thinking of. Supremacy is all about being better and having more than those around you. Bloop. Capitalism is the child of supremacy, and capitalism is pretty much the only reason that many of us, myself included, have ever even heard of yoga. But yoga was here way before capitalism was the loudest voice in the room, and it existed beyond what, what capitalism can define. And no matter how many poses you practice, whether you, you're upside down or inside out or twisted into a pretzel, you'll always end up drawing that exact same conclusion that there's no amount of yoga postures that will make you better than somebody else, anybody else. Ultimately, mastering postures is a moot point. Postures aren't about getting shit perfect. After all, you're, you were perfect, you were already perfect before the postures and being able to practice them isn't gonna uh, shift that truth. 
I think obsessively practicing yoga postures, especially drilling the same ones over and over again, is a lot like scratching an itch or picking at a scab. If I'm being honest, I know that I've used postures as a form of, of self-mutilation. I've drilled sun salutations and repetitively practiced deep back bends and inversions for the same reasons that I have known, been known to chew my cuticles and until the uh, beds are stained with blood because it feels good to hurt myself. I want to hold on to the headstands and splits and wheels because they feel like proof that I once knew the truth. I covet the photos of my practice like they are Girl Scout badges, like they're golden stars adhered to my forehead before lunch. Look, mama, today in school, I learned how to achieve bliss. I learned how to be okay. I learned how to live. I learned how to do it right. No matter how toned your abs get, some kind of spiritual reckoning is always on your horizon. Postures exhaust your physical body so your mind can arrive in the present moment. When a yoga pose kicks the shit out of your physical body, the mind is finally able to rest. When the muscles, bones, and ligaments work together, it's like plugging in the truth of all that is, and only when your whole body is integrated in that possible, is it possible to see within yourself. But the yogic path is just preparation for death. The final stage is your inevitable decay. It's not a preventative measure, but it's a way of showing up fully for both the voyage and the destination of the infinite. Gradually, for one reason or another, your body is going to stop working the way it once did, and your skin wrinkles and sags, you'll be forced to reckon with what lies underneath it all, and that wisdom you've gained from the inevitable reckoning will always trump the naive glory of your physicality. Your pastoral work doesn't need to be particularly complicated. Honestly, you really only need to know one pose and it's called sitting the fuck down. In fact, give it a shot right now. Sit down and be quiet. You don't need to cross your legs because you don't need legs. You don't need to sit upright because lying on your back is just as legit. Are you comfortable yet? Great. Now just try to maintain this posture. Is your mind racing? Are you holding your breath? Are you fidgeting? Are you holding back the urge to speak? Are you worried about yesterday? Are you thinking about what's on your plate for later today? Probably, that's chill. After all, you're human and all of that shit's totally normal. Don't try to freeze time, just try to be here now. Just try to bear witness to yourself. Breathing your way into the present moment is the whole function of yoga postures. The single purpose of every posture is to bear witness to your fidgets and your held breaths and the cacophony of noise e echoing in your mind. And in my experience, trying to do all this shit in a shape like crisscross applesauce is hard enough without also mimicking a Cirque du Soleil contortionist. But just because poses aren't the most important part of yoga doesn't mean they're not still lit. When you focus on your body, you situate yourself in the present moment. There's nowhere else to turn towards but right now. Working on your postures is beautiful and it offers so many lessons. Postural work is likely a really good metaphor. And like a real good metaphor, every posture is so much more than it seems on the surface. Take a sip. In every pose, whether you're right side up or upside down, revel in the magnitude of what it is to experience your full attention. From that space, give yourself permission to focus entirely on how your body behaves. Explore how every single piece of your meat suit arrives in the this exact moment. In every pose, consider how your head is hanging and in which direction your heart is beating. Consider that if you breathe more intentionally, it may even be possible to relax that tiny sliver of muscle right between your butt cheeks. Consider the tension held between your eyebrows and between the wrinkles in your knees. Enjoy the curious sensation as your jaw finally unhinges. Consider all of this and more in every posture, from every pose to scorpion handstand. The shape of the posture or how long you hold it or whether or not you use props is irrelevant and maybe this doesn't need to be said but i'm not but i'm still gonna say it what anyone else has to say about what your body looks like in this posture is especially irrelevant it really 
I really can't overemphasize this point. You know as well as I do that your body is going to keep changing every day for the rest of your life. Your body literally feels different every day, and I agree that the constant change is pretty obnoxious. That's always some new there's always some new ache or pain or hair that wasn't there before or some cancer that wasn't there before or whatever bullshit card that life's uh <laughs> petty bitch ass hand has dealt uh decided to slide your way. You can really count on the wheel of fortune to always keep turning no matter what. And luck won't always be on your side, regardless of your age or the time of the day or how long it's been since your last meal. No matter what's going on in your body, no matter how you look today, no matter who you are today. By moving your body, you can find some version of stillness. And actually, what we call stillness is really just the energetic space between inhales and exhales of motion. What looks like stillness is really just the same science that makes uh, zoetropes so magical. Still, since stillness is found in motion, I like to put my body in motion to find it. Not always, but definitely sometimes. I find that I can only really be still once I've moved my body around. Me too. Sometimes a little and sometimes a whole fucking lot. Especially if I've spent a lot of time plugging into the matrix if I've been caught up in work, or if my mask is on too tight. It can be helpful to jostle my body a little to get my mind pointing in the right direction. Initially, that process can be fucking brutal, depending on what I had for breakfast, or when I fell asleep, or who has pissed me off, mostly more recently, or how long it's been since I've had a moment alone. Depending on all those factors, and more, my body might not be interested in stillness because it's congested with everything I've ingested and digested physically, mentally, and emotionally. Hey. Just sent out some waves. Postural flows don't have to be complicated on paper. You don't have to practice three firefly poses in a row to get beneath the surface of yourself. I don't know. I say that, and then I think that some people obviously really do need that. They do need to practice three firefly poses in a row to be still. In fact, it stands to reason that if you're a really physically active person, you may need to keep upping the ante as your body acclimates to high intensity inter interval uh, postural style in order to arrive at stillness. But that withstanding, sometimes the most basic shit is all you really need, and sometimes poses that seem really simple end up being harder than anything else. I think the hardest part of practicing poses is mental rather than physical. The lessons they provoke are oceanic, oceanic mind fucks, pulling up shit I'd rather ignore, sometimes stuff I've been ignoring on purpose for decades. Crying is a regular state of affairs and within the solitude of the postures that's all the time in the world to cry, like a little baby. The hardest poses usually offer the best lessons. They taste like Robitussin on the way down, but they'll clear out your spiritual congestion like none other. There's a beauty to the difficulty and an elegance to the pain. Really, the complexity of them is decadent. The pain and the difficulty have so much to teach, and leaving them out is like spoiling the punchline of a really great joke. In my experience, the pose are always pulling up some shit you've needed to deal with for years, maybe ever since you were born. But even though it always feels good to let your wounds breathe, that don't make it smell any better when you peel back the bandage. <laughs> for me, is twisting postures. They're a mindfuck for me. I've historically hated them because they make me work my gut and working towards better gut health has turned into an unexpected journey of my post-Saturn return. Which is to say, I know way more about enzymes and probiotics now than I did before my 27th birthday. But I digress. Twisting postures are particularly good for the gut because they wring out the organs in your midsection. Twisting your midsection is really the only way that a lot of our bodily organs will ever get massaged. Liver, stomach, pancreas, small intestine, large intestine, all of that shit. Twisting massages your organs, and when they're massaged, they can work at optimal capacity. But if you're like me and you don't twist your midsection that much, your organs can't get massaged. And when they don't get ma when they don't get a little massage every now and again, they don't work that well. Just like your shoulders and lower back, every part of your physical body needs to be massaged from time to time. But like a bitch, but for a bitch like me, twisting postures don't always feel that great. Sometimes they can feel downright terrible, like hot shit spread on a cracker. I find twists that some people consider basic to be complicated as fuck. Sometimes they even feel painful. 
Here's what I do. When the posture starts to feel painful, I back the fuck off. And there's a striking difference between sensation and pain. I could try to explain it, but I won't because it's really something you have to understand for yourself. But once you understand the difference, it becomes a lot easier to make even the most physically challenging postures accessible for where your body is today, not where it could be in the future or where it once was in the past. I spend much of my pastoral practice figuring out ways to make the poses feel more accessible for my body as it is right now. Not how it was yesterday or how it might be tomorrow. Not necessarily more comfortable, but certainly more bearable. Once I find a way to practice a posture that's more accessible to how my body feels today, I'm able to just try breathing in that posture for as long as possible. As my breath develops, my posture deepens. As for breathing, that's a whole other kettle of fish entirely. But suffice it to say, breathing is a lot more complicated than settling onto any in, into anybody's yoga posture. And speaking of being improvisatory about where we land I'm going to take a break from poses and maybe we'll look at this chapter on I want it to go to breath but we have about 15 more minutes so I think I'd like to read a tiny bit from this chapter on wealth and other American values. I'm going to start on, hmm, I guess I'll start on page 72. Let's see where this takes us. You want confirmation that you're doing it right, but the confirmation you seek can only be found inside yourself. Yoga is the reminder that everything you seek is already happening inside of you all the time. But what about yoga in the era where everyone even your gram great grandma is looking for validation on the internet when followers become proof of life proof of identity proof of purpose the quest for follow followers trip me up every time hubris and greed are my shallow side and seeking followers never fails to dilute my message while also distancing me from my mission i surely sought the limelight but a bitch definitely didn't know what she was getting herself into and i didn't understand the damage caused by standing in artificial light a light that beams from others is subject to fluctuations in both luster and opacity. I underestimated what it feels like to bask in a beam of liquid gold one minute and have it snuffed into obsidian without notice. Consumerism is America's religion, but it's an unsatisfactory replacement for spiritual practice. Spiritual dissatisfaction is at the core of our collective unhappiness. Capitalism thrives when you hate yourself and there always be a... Uh, a cuter dress, a more impressive house, or a better pair of shoes. Nothing you buy will ever be enough, and it's set up that way by design. But while capitalism is all about looking outside of yourself, yoga says the exact opposite. Yoga and capitalism are like oil and water. They just don't go together. In my experience, American yoga culture has less to do with spiritual comprehension and more to do with buying shit. Acquiring possessions has become the primary metric of spiritual comprehension, but that tracks with the rest of American society. Americans value performance of life over embodied living. We cling to our mask and idolize celebrity culture. We live our lives like vaguely script reality shows, but when we inevitably realize just how little can be gained from worshiping money, the vast darkness that follows can be fatally debilitating. Capitalism provides no context for the afterlife, so we walk around unaware of our ever-present divinity. Since wealth, in the American religion, since, wealth, since wealth is the American religion, we don't question consumerism's presence in the yoga world, but maybe it should be questioned. Every yoga person eventually realizes that money plus power will never equal bliss. Personally, I think the wealth that usually accompanies American yoga practitioners shows that wealthy people are more aware of this than anyone else. I've often wondered if children born of wealth are quickest to embrace yoga because they're exposed to capitalism's empty promises straight out from the gate. Yo, that's like what I say to myself all the time. Yes to that. Capitalism offers no concept of spirituality, just wealth acquisition and idolatry. The intersection of capitalism and yoga is particularly gruesome. Yoga teachers perform as jesters in the court of their students. And how 
as I ask, are you supposed to provide a spiritual mirror for your fellow practitioners if you're trying to figure out how to lick their assholes at the same time? Y'all. I can tell you from personal experience that it's a weird angle from which to see yourself reflected. It's a certain type of person who becomes an American yoga teacher, especially in the digital age. Becoming a licensed insurance card carrying yoga teacher requires enough liquid capital to pay for yoga teacher training and all the associated um, accruements. It requires excess time and energy to both practice and contemplate the esoteric. For a, lo for a long time, rich white people were the only ones who fit this equation. But as time has progressed, so has the diversity of American yoga teachers. The first lesson of teaching yoga in the digital age is don't suck dick for free because you'll end up broke with chap lips. Every corner of capitalism has a price and it's better to know yours than to pretend the limit does not exist. But I got to tell you, I can't speak for anyone else. And I need to find a separation between yoga and money because the combination is polluting my soul. I think money and spirituality are generally a problematic combo. Money distorts the communion between fellow seekers by festering socioeconomic hierarchies. All human beings are grown from the same soil, regardless of how much money we've got. No, none among us has a monopoly on spiritual connection to the divine and wealth won't bridge the divide to enlightenment any faster than poverty. Much of the American yoga industrialized complex consists of us selling iterations of the practice to each other as a means of supporting our personal capitalist agendas. On the one hand, maybe it is this uh, literal antithesis of yoga, but on the other hand, it's created a very interesting sociological experiment. Instead of nomadically retreating from the confines of capitalist society, American yoga practitioners find ways to finance and pursuit of spiritual truth while swimming in the mainstream. American yoga practitioners expect to pay for their expect to pay for their yoga in the same way they expect to pay for everything else. In return, I expect to sing for the supper. But my heart's not in the show anymore. At best, teaching yoga is an offering of self-reflection to others. Charging money for the privilege of self-reflection makes me feel gross. I always end up behaving like a good little capitalist and charging for my services. Bitches gotta eat after all, and so do my team. But it still makes me feel gross. Teaching yoga on social media means fighting with your ego every day. Praying it doesn't eventually swell so large that you turn into a blimp. It means checking in constantly, constantly checking. It means posting, constantly posting. It means creating, constantly creating, but always with the other person in mind, always with your fellowship riding shotgun. The follower begins to color your inner soul. It becomes hard to see yourself without them. It's hard to know yourself without them. It means constantly thinking of ways to do better, to do more than the other guy. It's a never ending state of comparison. No amount of work is ever enough and the good and the idea of good enough becomes a fantastical myth. I don't think it's possible to work in social media without these feelings eventually rising to the surface. Frankly, I don't think you can engage with social media at all without eventually arriving on this page. But because we have because it's 12.52 and I do want to end on time. There's another part that she uh, continues to um, talk about capitalism and it's on this one section. I forgot to share um, the page numbers for those of you who have the book, um, but it's the chapter on breathing. So breathing. And it might be that we just close with breathing even though there's always so much more to share. Okay. You couldn't have paid me to care less about breathing when I first started practicing yoga. I thought it was a waste of my time and I completely disregarded it as a practice. I thought the most important yoga was the yoga of acrobatic over splits and scorpion uh, forearm stance. And I would gladly rush through my breath work to get to the postural calisthenics that I favored over breathing. But I did finally start to care. It was only after realizing that applying focus to my breath would strengthen my yoga postures. You really can't practice yoga postures without establishing a strong connection to breathing. Breathing is low key the only thing that actually matters. When you're in yoga class and shit starts to go south, it's usually because you've stopped breathing. It happens with such a subtle quickness too. 
and I usually mistake it for something else. All of a sudden, everything about practicing yoga becomes terrible. The poses are too hard, the teacher's a dick, the room's too hot, my pants are too tight, my mat's too small, the person next to me smells like garbage, the works. But all that really happened was that I forgot to breathe, and not breathing made me lose touch with reality. Breathing is what defines a yoga practice, because breathing connects you to the life force that constantly is flowing in and around you. Everything that lives is breathing, and that shared energy is what unites us. You, me, maggots, whales, penguins, Santa Claus. We all breathe. Well, maybe not Santa Claus, but you get the idea. It doesn't matter if you breathe through tubes, water, or photosynthesis, because it's all the same breath. When you intentionally connect to this all-encompassing life force, you're reminded that life is a lot bigger than the jobs you do, the mask with a capital M that you wear, and the responsibilities you manage. Find your breath and you're practicing yoga. The posture itself is irrelevant. That means you, me, and everyone we know are always practicing yoga in every posture, whether it's clear to us or not. When you realize yoga isn't just happening when you're on a yoga mat, it becomes clear that the breath is the first thing that should be established in every moment and not just when you're practicing a sequence of postures. Because really, every moment in life is a yoga posture, standing up tall. When someone's trying to shrink you is a yoga posture. Protecting your loved ones is a yoga posture. Finding the breath in these moments inspires you to action and confirms your faith. Sometimes finding your breath can be the difference between seeing someone else's point of view and punching them in the face. Finding the breath isn't always simple. Sometimes it can be hard as fuck. I think it's impossible to remind yourself to breathe too frequently because there are endless opportunities to forget. Some days it feels like peeling, pulling teeth to remember, but to engage with your subtle spiritual body, you've got to gain some level of control over your physical body. Postures are one part of how you gain control and pranayama frequently translates as breath work is the other. This is one of my favorite parts in the book and it'll be my last, you know, section. Prana is the cosmic energy that constantly is moving through and around us. Prana imbalance is the cause of most suffering and it physically manifests as injuries and disease. By controlling prana and how it flows through your body, you can be more aware of and present to all the nerve endings and thoughts within your mental and emotional bodies. When you hold your breath, you retain and restrict the functions of your physical body. Oxygen is the most important component to the functioning human body, and restricting access is literally the quickest way to die. But, hap but what happens when you're under stress? What's the first thing you kick to the curb? Breathing. You start holding your breath or refusing to breathe as soon as the panic sets in. And the only way to release the sensation is to breathe it through. Yoga postures filter your body through, uh, through, filter your breath through your body so that your physical body can find rest for meditation. Breath is the butter that sizzles in your body's cast iron skillet. Like a cast iron skillet, your body can cook all the things, but it's going to need a little fat to get shit popping. The breath is that fat. The body is a vessel that's capable of experiencing and comprehending the deepest mysteries of the universe, but only when it's been seasoned and united with all the components. When you have control over your physical body, you're able to bear witness to your subtle body. You're able to experience the you, capital Y, and breath and beneath your mass, capital M. In this way, pranayama benefits every physical practice, not just traditional yoga postures, but every kind of physical activity. Again, every moment in every life circumstance is yoga in action. My life's anxieties and ha unhappiness come from disconnection to your breath. The panic I feel in anxiety attacks is always cued by not breathing. Reestablishing a connection to my breath is always my first step in dealing with anxiety. I use the same technique to manage anxiety when I, I use when I'm struggling with yoga postures. I always return to my breath. Breath comes first, with all physical and mental actions following in its wake. Usually when a posture or life situation feels difficult or out of reach, it's because my mind is driving and I've thrown my breath in the back seat. The breath helps me understand that the posture isn't out to get me and that regardless of what it looks like, my body is always getting exactly what it needs. When a posture or life circumstance predetermined when a posture or life circumstance 
challenges or pushes me beyond one of my many predetermined limits. I've never, it's never that that posture is out of my reach or that the challenging circumstance shouldn't be happening to me. It is really that my expectation of what I'm capable of are holding me back from accepting who I am. If prana is the cosmic energy, then pranayama is the regulation of that energy. You correct your prana and balance through regulation and retention of your breath. Practicing pranayama both individually within yourself and collectively with all your creation means gaining a greater control of the unseen matter that powers you, me, and everyone around us. However, the whole concept of prana is frequently misunderstood in American yoga. I mean, I'm part of the problem. Like most people, I tend to translate the Sanskrit word for pranayama as breath work. Breath work is pranayama's most obvious translation because the most obvious demonstration of pranayama is the way breath passes in and out of your, your lungs. But prana consists of much more than air, evidenced by the fact that all living beings share more with each other than just air. Prana is the unspoken, connective, energetic tissue between all of us. It's everything that fills up the space around you, not just what's visible to your naked eye. Not even air is visible to the naked eye. Prana is the cosmic energy that has fascinated scientists and mathematicians for thousands of years and inspired an untold number of equations and theories. Prana carries your thoughts and emotions. It's the chariot of our love, hate, fear, sadness, and dreams. You can feel the weight of prana when a room's tension can be cut with a knife and when the Holy Spirit has entered the building. You can feel it in the heat of the ruck ruckus mob and in a natal delivery room. Within the molecules between you and me are collective emotions, stories, and dreams. You can feel the weight of his presence even if you can't see prana with your eyes. And even though you can't see it with your eyes, if you open your heart, you can feel prana from inside out. Pranayama is the way all of our energy collides. And while it's one singular collective energy, it's also an infinite number of energies held within an infinite number of physical bodies. Prana holds all of our heartache and our, all of our joy. It's the very essence of everything. It is so much more than the passage of oxygen through lungs. My final paragraphs. But America is nothing if not a capitalist experiment. And if there's one thing capitalism doesn't give a fuck about is cosmic energy or anything or any of the other fruity shit I was just talking about. In that way, pranayama is rarely, if ever, accurately uh, translated in mainstream American yoga. If American yoga, in American yoga, capitalism has programmed us to believe only in what we can see with the naked eye and what can be collectively agreed upon. But everything can be, can't be seen with the naked eye. And we're not always going to agree on everything. Regulating the fluctuation in cosmic energy is how you and I can start accepting the shit that tears us apart. The breath unites every single piece of all of us. Without control of the breath, you and I will never find unity beyond our perceived differences. So... That is halfway through the chapter on breathing, but since I was really just given, you know, an hour's time, I'll have to just kind of end on breath, but the other chapters on smoking weed, on cultural appropriation, white guilt is fire. The, the, the part on, and you can win a free book uh, today, and you can win this book. This book is, Vanessa, this book is on point. The part on meditation, y'all, I am still reading, and I read in and out of order um, because it all holds true. And I'm really thankful for Jessamine for, you know, providing us with this offering. It's, uh, it's been really um, helpful for me in my writing journey. And reminding me to lean into adapting to and to leaning into my own intuition because our intuition is what grounds us and what allows for us to um, be in the world and hold space as we truly are and are meant to be. And so, my friends, um, I will have to leave you with 
that with this but I hope you enjoyed the reading and make sure to pick up this beautiful book from this very insightful person and have a great day take good care